This is the Inner the Buzz podcast, helping smart businesses be even more innovative. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Welcome to episode number 97 of the InnovaBuzz podcast, designed to help smart businesses committed to innovation, to service and modern marketing become even more innovative. In this episode, I welcome back to the podcast as my guest, Ian Altman, author of Same Side Selling, Upside Down Selling, speaker, host of the Grow My Revenue podcast, and founder of the Same Side Selling Academy. We discuss a modern approach to sales, treating sales as a framework, as a service, and being laser focused on the problems you solve for your clients. This episode is packed with great advice for any business and is well worth spending your time to listen and have a pen and paper ready to take notes. Now, we also talk about access displacement disorder, which I found quite humorous, and it's a symptom of people thinking that the world revolves around them, which, of course, it doesn't. So... Listen to the podcast to hear Ian explain that in a lot more detail. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Ian Altman. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to welcome back to the InnovaBuzz podcast today on this episode, all the way from Washington DC in the USA, Ian Altman of Grow My Revenue. Now Ian is a sought after speaker, he's the author of of two Amazon number one bestsellers, uh, those being Same Side Selling and Upside Down Selling. And he hosts the Grow My Revenue podcast. He also is a regular columnist for the digital edition of both Forbes and Inc. magazines. So welcome back to the podcast, Ian. Jürgen, thanks for having me back. You know, I'm always worried if I'm going to be invited back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... I'm I'm looking through the list. We're getting close to 100 episodes. I'm looking through the list of people we've had, and I think, oh, it's been a while since I spoke to Ian, for example, and, and maybe we should have him back and see what's new. And, and certainly on episode 70, Ali McGill um, was on, and he suggested you as a guest that we bring on to the podcast. So I said, oh, we've, we've already had you on, but we'll have you back again because it's been a while. Well, so what's I'm what's glad, I'm glad I'm glad that other people are recommending me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's always good, isn't it? <laughs> so what's been happening since we last spoke? Uh, you know, I've um, I, I've had the good fortune of working with a lot of great companies on how to expand and accelerate their business, and I've actually had several of my clients sell their companies, and uh, after achieving some pretty remarkable growth. So one of them went from about seventeen million to one hundred and nine million in three mm-hmm. years. And another one went from about thirty million to about one hundred and twenty million, and um, you know it's it's fun to see that when you see people sell their companies, end up with a windfall of cash, and the fact that they give me any credit for it, I think, is uh, very flattering. And then I just launched this thing called the Same Side Selling Academy, that um, I was concerned whether or not would get anybody who wanted to participate. And so I was hoping we'd launch it with about 25 to 30 people, and we have 150 or so right now. So um, it's a private Facebook group of people looking to really dive into same-side selling. So all in all, things have been great, just uh, traveling a fair amount. And uh, I had a stint a few months back where I lost my voice, which, <laughs> as a professional speaker, was a humbling experience. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that that's a real issue. And I, I know because we reached out at that point and, and – we were told you need to recover your voice, which is perfectly <laughs> understandable. <laughs> so I'm glad to hear that's all back. We did have a brief chat beforehand, and and it seems like it's all coming good now. Yeah, everything's everything's back to normal, but it was uh, it was a little bit of a wake up call. Hmm. All right. So um, I've been doing a lot of marketing work with my clients, as I mentioned to you earlier, and I was fascinated. Um, reading Same Side Selling, because when we spoke last time, it was relatively new and I hadn't actually read it. Um, But 
in the meantime, I've read the book and, and I can highly recommend it to anyone. It starts off with the premise of, first of all, selling as a framework. Now, I love frameworks, so anything that can be put into a framework and structured in a way that you follow certain steps or you learn from the structure of it and, and can then implement um, that structure in your own business, That I love that. And the second thing, of course, where the title comes from is that you talk about getting on the same side as your client. So you're not actually playing a game where one side wins, one side loses. It's a puzzle that you put together. It's a puzzle that you work on putting together together. Does that make yep. sense? So I'll let you explain that some more. Well, so the, the idea is that is that in most uh, most every book that's been written about sales either uses a game metaphor or a battle metaphor. And mm. in the game metaphor, <laughs> there's a winner and a loser. And in the battle metaphor, the loser dies. So, <laughs> and then we wonder why when we use that metaphor, we end up in an adversarial trap where the buyer and seller are at odds with one another. And my co-author, Jack Quarles, is a guy who spent two decades in purchasing and procurement. And one of the metaphors we talk about is think about using – Thing, using a puzzle metaphor, and the idea is that, look, if I have half the pieces to a puzzle, and my clients, there's a, there, there's a client out there with the other half of the pieces, if I find somebody else who doesn't have the same, the, the pieces to the same puzzle I do, no matter how hard I try, it's not going to fit. Mm. So what it means is that instead of thinking of everybody you meet as someone who's a potential buyer, instead you want to think to yourself, Who's a good fit for what I've got? What are the problems that they're facing? And if I can help them solve those problems, that's someone who's worth my time and I'm worth their time. And if, and if the person I'm talking to isn't facing the problem that we're good at solving, it's probably not a good use of either of our time, and that's okay. So it's not a matter of rejection. We just got to the truth a whole lot faster than maybe we would have. Yeah, that's a really valid point, which people – and I, I guess it comes back to the the idea of the game and and a battle <laughs> where I like you, what you said one person dies so that people take that rejection really um, as a tragedy whereas yeah. what um, if if it's a puzzle and if there's not a good fit then the rejection really is saving your time and it's also saving that client's time so you're not um, leaving with a bad taste in your mouth you kind of parting company and saying spend your time elsewhere. Yeah, and, and guess what? You might know somebody who has the pieces that fit their puzzle. Mm. And you say, look, I'm not the best person, but I know someone else who has those pieces. Let me put you in touch with them. And it creates a much more even-handed approach. See, the, I, most people in sales feel like it's a beauty pageant, and they get paraded <laughs> in front of the client for the client to then make a decision, yes or no. And instead, what we want to do is say, look, with the client, we're going to mutually determine if our puzzle pieces fit together. And if they do, that's great. And if not, then we just both saved a bunch of time and we'll point them in the right direction. And there's nothing depressing about that. And it's just, the, it's just a fact of life. It's the way it's going to work. And so once you accept that, it makes it so that there's less fear of rejection. Plus, if you want to engage non-salespeople, that integrity-based approach is much more appealing than the notion of, look, go out and sell something whether the client mm. needs it or not. Yeah, yeah that's right. So um, give us some insights into how do you approach that? How do you do that determining if there's a good fit in a way that is efficient, effective, and you know, leaves everybody feeling happy about whatever the outcome is? Well, so, so in, the, in the book, in Chapter 4, we talk about a concept called the same-side pitch. And the same-side pitch has three components of entice, disarm, and discover. And first, we entice by sharing problems that we solve with dramatic results. We then disarm the notion that we're just there to sell something by acknowledging that not everyone's a good fit for us. And then we trigger a discovery phase to learn more about their situation to see if we can help. Now, the trick to all this is understanding the first part, which is what are the problems you're good at solving? And mm. most businesses are really good at understanding what it is that you do, yeah. but not so good at understanding why people need it. 
And so the, the example that I encourage people to think about is this, which is, look, if you were overhearing a conversation between your two, between two people who were your ideal client, complaining about something that you would know if you heard it, wow, I can really help them, what would it sound like in their words? And so the closer we get to using their language, the better it is. So in my business, it might be someone who says, man, I'm sick and tired of our message falling on deaf ears. And our ideal clients, we can never capture their attention. Or it might be somebody who says, um, man, you know, our stuff is really specialized, but our clients treat us like a commodity and everything comes down to price versus value. So if those are the complaints or what, what I often refer to at my Bob Lemon call, my buddy Bob Lemon calls the elevator rants, yeah, then, like that. <laughs> then, then with the, with the, if those are the rants then the same side pitch would be our clients come to us when, and then fill in your elevator rant. For the right organizations, they tell us we deliver amazing results, but not everyone we talk to is the right fit for how we approach that. I don't yet know if we can help you, but if that's something you're looking to solve, I'm happy to learn more to see if we can help. So if I, if I now take that construct and apply the rants that I just described, it might sound something like this, which is, so my clients come to me when their message falls on deaf ears, so inferior competitors are capturing more of their attention than they are. And when they do capture someone's attention, they treat them like a commodity, and it all comes down to price versus value. For the right organizations, they tell me that we're able to shift that paradigm, give their people the proper skills so that they get in there early, and the clients are buying based on value versus price. But the way we approach that isn't the right fit for everyone. I don't yet know if we can help you, but if that's something you're facing, I'm happy to learn more to see if we can help. And if I do that, I'm showing up as someone who's there to solve an issue, not someone who's just there to sell something. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's such a great message. So I think, you know, what you wrapped up with there, which is you're there to solve an issue or a problem, um, not to sell something. So if you have that mindset to start with, that's, that's a great, um, great way to approach this. But I, I really like, you know, you've kind of turned the typical – uh, elevator pitch thing on its head, right? A lot of people come from the point of I, I do X and solve Y with the result Z, you know, and for this audience. So it's very much, as you said, uh, every organisation knows what they do and, and so they're focused on themselves rather than on solving the problem for the customer or the potential customer. It, exactly. And so the idea is that if someone's facing one of those issues, you have something that's worth talking about. If they're not, it's not really a good use of either of our time. Mm. Yeah, I love it. So um, the key thing then to start with is to really know your customer, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, you have to, you have to fully understand why they need what you do mm. more so than what it is that you do. So I, I hear from, you know, I, I work with a lot of companies in the technology space and people say, Oh, we have this cool technology. It does, you know, a, B, you know, a, B and C. And I say, great. Why do people need it? Oh, you just have to see it. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> I, I don't need to see it. I need to understand why they need it. What happens in their world if they don't have it? Oh, you, if you saw it, you would fall in love with it. That's great. I might fall yeah. in love with it, but I'm probably not going to spend the money to buy it. So, I need to understand why they need it. And it just becomes a circular process until finally somebody realizes, ah, I guess he's not going to let up on this. I guess we actually <laughs> do have to, we do have to figure this out. Mm. That's right. And, and the moment you address the why, why people need it or what problem it's going to solve and, and perhaps a little bit of how that's going to solve it, that's where the discussion with the, client will start right because before that they're not interested <laughs> yeah they might exactly. fall in they might fall in love with the product but it probably the basis of that falling in love is going to be it solves a big problem for them exactly well that or what happens is you're talking to a lower level person who eventually needs to get someone's approval hmm. and i've done a lot of research on how executives make and approve decisions and the questions they ask come down to very simple ones which is when, when their employee comes in and says, I want to buy this thing, they ask them, what problem does this solve? Why do I need it? And what's the likely outcome or result? Well, so if I can't understand, if I can't explain what problem it solves and why I need it, and I can't have that discussion with the, the person I'm talking to, they're not going to get it approved. 
Yeah. So I need to make sure that I can understand that and that the person I'm dealing with can articulate it because if they can't, they might love it, but they're still not going to get the money for it. Hmm. That's good. really good advice. I was reading something just a few moments ago actually on one of the Facebook groups that I'm a mentor for and, and the situation was uh, that the person was making a pitch um, and the contact at the client end said, um, oh, so the person said, I'd like to get together with you and the CEO and all the other decision makers to really understand the need. So essentially a discovery session. And the person at the other end came back and said, well, there's three, three people we're putting this out to and um, the C you're going to meet with me because the CEO, you know, we have to value his time or so, some words to that effect. Um, and and so you're just meeting with me. So the person kind of was in a dilemma because they felt that the discovery session wouldn't really get to the needs of that company without actually talking to all the key stakeholders. So w what are your thoughts on that kind of situation? Well, so when that happens, there's a couple thing, there's a couple things that trigger that type of response. So the the first thing is they said, well, I want to get together with the other decision makers. Interesting enough, inside the company, no one refers to different people as decision makers. Only mm -hmm. salespeople refer to people as decision makers. Mm -hmm. um, so the challenge is that the salesperson in this situation is seeing the sale as the finish line, whereas the client sees the results as the finish line. So if instead of saying, well, I'd like to get all the, all the decision makers in a room together, that sounds like you're pushing for the sale. If you said, look, I want to make sure I'm not missing anything important that you're going to need because I don't want to give you a proposal to deliver something without knowing what's important, and I want to make sure that we have a way to measure the results so you can hold us accountable. How can we get the information from the senior executives to make sure that we've got it well enough documented that we can be accountable? And now it's a different ask. So what you're asking for is, look, these people want to meet to make sure that we can hold them accountable, not they want to meet with the decision maker because they're hoping to make a sale. Mm. And so there's different ways that you can address this, but oftentimes it's about helping the client realize and the person you're dealing with realize that you actually are not in the best position to help them Excuse me, without, without that conversation. So if you can have that conversation – then you're in a much better position. If you can't have the conversation, how are you going to help them? You don't even know what the, what the major needs are. Yeah, and they right. know that just as well as you do. So if you present it in a way that makes sense to them, then all of a sudden they say, oh, okay, now I get it. But if you don't do it that way, if you don't engage them in the dialogue, then you're probably not going to win it anyhow. Because guess what? That CEO is probably meeting with somebody Hmm. And if it's not you, you're at a supreme disadvantage yeah, that's right. to win that deal. Hmm. So people always say, oh, well, I don't want to upset anybody. It's like, look, upset them. Because if you don't have the meeting, you're losing anyhow. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's really good advice. And I guess it comes back to that whole mindset of you're not out to sell. You're out to build a partnership with a client and deliver a solution to a need that they have. And as you said, the selling uh, doesn't finish with signing the deal or whatever it might be. Exactly. So so once we realize that the finish line is not the sale, then we have different discussions. And mm. so there's a, there's a construct that we teach people called the same side quadrants that talks about when you're meeting with a client, you have to understand not only what their issue is, but what's the impact, meaning what happens if they don't solve it, and then how you're going to measure the results of that. And we need to understand who else – needs to be involved. And that's one of those things that may be challenging for some people, but that's the kind of information we need, we need to capture. See, too often salespeople, salespeople go out to a meeting, they come back and they're like, oh, I had the best meeting. It was the greatest meeting. We were supposed to meet for only 20 minutes, and instead we met for an hour. And I tell you, as soon as I got there, wow, we just totally clicked, we totally connected, and the meeting went so well that we agreed that next week we're going to meet again. And that's how people describe a good meeting. Hmm. But the reality is that's how you would describe a good interaction 
on an online dating site. It has nothing to do with whether or not it's a good business meet. So the question is, are people going on business dates or are they doing business? And so we want to give people a better way to manage the meetings. So we created this idea of the same side quadrants, which is a note-taking method that basically you take a sheet of paper, you draw a vertical line down the center, a horizontal line across the center, making four quadrants. In the upper left, you write in small letters the word issue. In the upper right, the word impact. In the lower left, the word results. In the lower right, others impacted. And then you take notes as you're meeting with the client in the respective quadrants. So when they talk about an issue, which might be something like, oh, well, you know, gee, my systems aren't working well. Let's say if someone was selling technology solutions. Then you say, well, what happens if you don't solve this? And the client says, oh, wow, I hadn't really thought about that. Well, but here's what happens. That's impact. Because impact is what happens if you don't solve it. And then you say, well, let's say we were successful. Six months from now, what would that look like? How would we know that we were successful? The client says, huh, I hadn't thought about that either. And they start mapping that out. Well, now what you're building is a business case for them that helps them make the case to other people about why they should go with your solution. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. That's, that's so true. I like what you said that, you know, people are going on business dates, not doing business. And I remember so often hearing the very same kind of text, um, you know, it was a great meeting. Um, they were really interested and so on. And, and kind of you wonder, months down the track, whatever happened to that? <laughs> yeah, well, by the way, and then what happens is it's like, oh, it was a great meeting, and then two weeks later you haven't heard from the client, and they call up with the most pathetic follow-up call that sounds like this. It's like, hey, just calling to check in. Want to see if you made a decision yet. <laughs> hey, just calling to check in. And it's like this pathetic, whiny request for an update that they don't owe you. Hmm. And so we want to get to the point that we're actually providing better ways to follow up. So in the context of if I don't get issue impact and importance and results and all these other things that, that, that move the bar for real opportunities, then I'm just like I may as well just invest in a cardboard sign and a Sharpie and a tin cup because I'm just begging for business. But instead, what I want to do is say, okay, what makes a good opportunity? Well, what makes a good opportunity is somebody who feels the pain associated with not solving a problem and sees the upside associated with solving it such that it's a no-brainer for them to invest the money. And if I get that information, then it's worth having an additional meeting. That's what we're trying to get to. So it's about working smarter, not necessarily harder. Hmm, that's great. Um, now, I know that you talk about um, being an educator and providing information as a means of education and follow-up in the book. Um, and you mentioned something there around, you know, the, the pathetic style of follow-up, you know, have you made a decision yep. kind of question. Um, talk to us a little bit about a good way to follow up when, when you're in a situation where, let's say, you, you do have the issues, the impact, the importance, results understood um, what's a good way to follow up on that when perhaps um, the decision needs to go to, I don't know, an executive board or something like that so that, that there is a need to kind of prompt a follow-up? Well, the, the first thing is that when you follow up, you want to follow up on things that are important to them, not things that are important to you. Hmm. So it's not, hey, I haven't heard from you and I'm trying to get yeah. my sales closed this quarter. That's not a good reason for them. But if you said to them, Look, I'm looking through my notes from when we met last time, and you mentioned that you had an issue that was costing you $30,000 a month, and if you didn't solve it, you might be looking for a new job. So I haven't heard back. I want to make sure we hadn't dropped the ball. Hmm. And now the client says, oh, yeah, I did forget about that. Thanks for reminding me because the scary part is that when we walk away from the meeting, life happens. Hmm. And – it doesn't mean that they don't care. It just means that something else came up that caught their attention. It means that a shiny object came up and they said, ooh, I'm going to focus on this shiny object now instead. Mm. That's right. That's the, big That's the big difference. So, so we need to collect 
reasonable information so that way we have something to follow up on and we're constantly evaluating is this a good opportunity or isn't it yeah so it's focus on the fit which you call chapter six right yeah yeah i really like that and it reminds me a little bit that you know it's the whole mindset of um service and solving a problem but at the same time also you know, not attributing a meaning to them not getting back to you, for example. Like you said, life gets in the way. You know, there was a new yeah, shiny I've, object I've, or whatever. Yeah. I've, I've, had people, I've had people say to me, oh, well, these guys didn't get back to us, so I'm just like, we're never going to call them again. And I said, well, okay, instead of jumping to that conclusion, why don't you just reach out to them and say, hey, I haven't heard back, you know, is everything okay? Hmm. And, you, and it's frightening how often someone will call up and they say, oh, is everything okay? Well, actually, yeah, my, my spouse, my child, the so-and-so had a car accident. Hmm. I had surgery, right? Someone had a heart attack. I mean, it's like there's all sorts of things that happen that have nothing to do with you. But the problem is that many people in sales suffer from something that I refer to as axis displacement disorder. <laughs> and, and axis displacement disorder is when they believe that the axis of the earth has shifted. It somehow goes through their head and out their rear end, and the world revolves around them. Uh, very good. <laughs> and so, and so, so the thing is that it's not all about you. In fact, if anything, it's all about the client. So we just want to make sure we're helping them solve things that are important, and that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. So, <laughs> access displacement disorder. I'm going to have to remember that one. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, it's not about you. It's about the client and it's about the problems you can solve. So, um, as I said before we started the interview, I've been doing a lot of work with clients on mapping out the marketing journey and, and it always starts with understanding who the ideal client is, who are the people that you want to work with that you can help and what what's their problem and what's their real issue so uh, your your book and your approach very much is consistent with that so what what's your framework there for because a lot of people really struggle with niching down and you know getting very specific about who it is that they help so what's your approach to help people deal with that well, so there, there's, there are a number of concepts that are in the book, and fundamentally it comes back to the idea of these elevator rants of understanding for your ideal client, what are the problems that you solve? But there's, there's another concept that, that I've introduced recently that's not even in the book, and it's what I refer to as the client buying vision. And the idea is that what we want to do is we want to help position ourselves for the client. So... Um, in fact, if you have, if there's a client you can think of that has some sort of product or service, I can show you kind of how we would do it for them. Um, if there's someone you can think of, um, it can be well, relatively generic. Okay. Well, what about a software company that writes custom software? Okay. So a software company, let's say, writes custom software, and they're probably competing at some level against people who are just doing their own things in house. That's right. And at right, some yeah. level, they're com- they're competing against. Um, they're competing against people who are looking to buy commercial off-the-shelf software and assume that that's going to do what they need. Yep. All right? So the, the way that we would approach that in this, in this client vision pyramid is this. Is we would, when, when you're talking to the client, you'd say, well, when people come to us about a challenge they have in their business that requires software, they're usually looking at three different levels. The first is the most basic, they're just looking for something that's effective. So maybe they've already got something in-house. It may not be perfect, but it kind of works, and that's the lowest cost. It's what most people find themselves in. It's effective, not necessarily everything it could be, but it kind of works. At the middle level is something that we refer to as the enhanced level, and that's where people might license software and say, look, so if we license the software, and then if maybe we can customize it, maybe we can tailor it, and maybe we can, if we do enough work over the next you know, year, year and a half, we could probably get it to do most of what we need, and maybe we change some of our processes to match the software, but all in all, it could be okay. Now, at the highest level, and these are the people at the top of their industry, these are people who come to us and say, look, I'm looking for something that's fully engaged. I want my employees, my customers, everyone to be highly engaged. 
And at that level, they know that it's not commercial software that's going to solve it for them. They really need something tailored to their needs based on industry standards. So, gee, Mr. Customer, which vision do you have? Hmm. And yeah. by the way, all we're looking for is the truth. So if they say, you know what, we're not willing to go the full, the full level and have fully engaged. We're just looking for something that's a little bit better than what we have. Maybe that client isn't for you. Mm. But the client who says, yeah, I want that fully engaged level, they've kind of just consciously said, okay, you're the type of solution I'm looking for. Mm. And that, so it, it, it repositions what you've got and the, and the way I draw it out is it's a pyramid with three sections. So the bottom section is the effective, the middle section is enhanced, the top section is engaged. And then you're just basically, and you'll notice the top section is the smallest one. That's look, here are the people operating at the pinnacle of the business. So in terms of efficiency and effectiveness, which one are you looking at? Now, the beauty is once they say, well, here's what I'm looking at, you know, I'm, I want that, then you get to ask them, well, by when? Mm. And they usually say something like, well, by next year. Okay. <laughs> and, and where do you think you are today? Well, right now we're barely at effective. All right. So what's your plan to get there? And the only plausible answer most of them can give is, well, that's why I'm meeting with you today. Mm. And it just helps position everything that's out there in a context that puts you in the right light. Yeah, that's, that's really good advice. And it's, again, it's, uh, kind of a very generic way to get at the need and position the client as well and determine is there a fit, you know, are we, are we a match on that uh, puzzle board? Yep. Hmm. Yeah, yeah so, it. It, so it, it helps us it, because guess what? The client says, now, nah, you know, I'm just looking for the cheapest way to make this go away. Yeah, yeah. It's probably not your client. Hmm. That's right. You show, a, me, you, show me, you show me somebody who wants the cheapest solution, and I'll tell you somebody who's probably going to be trying to solve it two or three times. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, now, the other thing that um, I really liked about your book and it really resonated with me because that's um, what I talk about a lot in the marketing journey is the fact that when you've made the sales, that's not the finish. And so you talk about, First of all, selling value, not price, and then delivering on those results. Yeah, so when the, when the client pushes back on price, you get to push back on results. So if the client said, well, gee, you know what? I know you said your solution is $25,000, but these other guys said that they'll do it for $15,000. Your answer should be, you know, the only way we could do it for less is if we sacrifice some of these results that we talked about. Hmm. And maybe other people aren't as committed to results as we are, but candidly, nothing is more important to us than results. So if you've got to go with somebody else, we certainly understand, but we're not willing to sacrifice or put your results at risk. And what it does is in the client's mind, they got to be thinking, well, no one else is talking about the results. I mean, the benefit I have is in working with enough organizations over the years, I know how few companies use this idea of focusing on results when they speak with their clients. Yeah. Because my clients who do this really stand out compared to the competition. So merely by talking about the results, I have clients who have shared with me emails from their customers where the customer says, look, this is a competitive bid. You were 20% more than everybody else, but we went with you because no one else had a meaningful conversation with us about results and you did. Hmm. And so we're more comfortable working with you. Now, it means that you have to be able to hold yourself accountable, but here's the thing. For anybody who thinks, oh, I don't know that we could be accountable for the results, what you have to realize in today's day and age is this. It used to be that if you made a mistake or you didn't deliver results, your customer might tell one or two people they know. And today, they'll tell millions of people they've <laughs> never even met. That's right, yeah. So we want to make sure, in fact, we should never do anything if we don't feel we can deliver the results. Mm. And so in my business, I'm emphatic about that. Someone will come to me and say, we want you to speak at this event. And I say, that's great. What are you looking to accomplish with your audience? 
And they'll often say, well, we don't know. Are you available on the date? I am available on that date. But if we don't understand what we're trying to accomplish, I can't tell you whether or not I can deliver that. Mm. And if I don't know if I can deliver it, how could you possibly make a decision? And it's funny because a lot of event organizers will say, well, no one else seemed to be concerned about that. <laughs> and I think to myself, huh, really? That, you know, how does that make you feel? Yeah. Because everyone should be focused on that. Yeah, nobody cares whether the event's a success or not. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So, I mean, th- those are the kinds of things that can really change the way things work. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's uh, such great advice. And it's things that uh, – it's something that is often overlooked. I mean, I know a lot of really good businesses that are focused on results, but they don't use it to um, – build that puzzle together with the client and, and then to make sure that they are being held accountable and holding themselves accountable and delivering on those results. So it kind of, kind of somewhere dissipates and, and loses the effect. Well, if you and, think about it, it, what percentage of clients do you think have ever had the benefit of speaking with a vendor who suggests to them, hey, let's make sure we put something in place so that we can all hold us accountable? Hmm. It never happens. So when it happens, you stand out. Yeah. That's right. It's sad that you do, but that's the way it is. And Yeah. And as, as, I, as, I, as I jokingly say to people, if someone said, well, what, what about when everybody is doing this? I said, look, if everyone's doing this, I'm no longer going to care because I'll be retired somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But right now I can tell you that not everyone is doing this. In fact, not even 2% of people are doing hmm. this. So yeah. you got a long ways to go. So be an early adopter instead of being someone who is, you know, you know, dragging down the end. Hmm. And and people look for ways to differentiate themselves, and they obsess over doing weird and wonderful things. And you know, that's it, there's some basic things you can do. Some fairly, you know, I mean, this is not really difficult to do. It's it's quite simple, and it will differentiate you. You know, I mentioned. Uh, Ali McGill earlier and we were talking in the podcast interview I did with him about customer service and delivering an exceptional experience to the customer um, and just doing little things, for example, in the onboarding process that um, immediately positions that relationship as something special and and the things that you do are fairly easy to do. But Unfortunately, most people don't do them. So it's it's the same kind of thing, isn't it? it? You know what? It very much is. In fact, there's a concept I talk about called the concise business case where we summarize issue, impact, importance, results, and others impacted for the client. And my clients will often tell me, they're like, man, it was just so amazing getting this email from you that summarized everything we had talked about. Well, all I'm doing them is sending them their words back in an email. Hmm. But when my clients do that with their customers, it changes everything. And they say, oh, my God, wow, look at the, look at the detail they provided us. Well, of course, you mean we're impressed that somebody took notes and cared about what you were saying? Like, that's how, bar the, that's how low the bar is set. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, there's, there's a fantastic piece of advice there. We talked earlier about following up with clients so uh, that that is a magical follow-up, and it's so easy to do. Well, it, by the way, it requires effort. It requires intention. Hmm. And the organizations that I work with who have seen dramatic growth put in the time and effort to do this stuff. And they will admit that they don't do it perfectly. But if, if the rest of your competitors are doing it not at all and you're doing it marginally well, then you look pretty darn good. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And and taking action is important on these things rather than waiting until you might have perfected something because um, perfection is a state that you never really achieve. So aim for excellence and take action, right? Exactly. Yeah, mm. and taking action is, is the key because you can, you can wait for everything to be perfectly set up, but it's kind of like a unicorn. Yeah. We hear about it, but I've never actually seen one. That's right. <laughs> All right. Um, so now, one of the other things that I talk a lot with um, with my clients is around content and educating your audience with content to 
make it clear what it is that you do, what problems you solve. Um, and I know, you know, last time we spoke, we talked quite a bit about content. So tell us a little bit how how are sales and content um, information related, and how do you advise using content? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I actually did a full day workshop with my friend Marcus Sheridan. Hmm about a month ago at the um, Marketing Profs B2B Forum in Boston. And it was all about how you integrate sales and content marketing. And what a lot of it comes down to is it's a, it's a two-way street, meaning the salespeople interact with clients all day long who are asking questions that often marketing hasn't addressed on the website. But guess what? If sales doesn't tell marketing about these conversations, then they may as well not have happened. Yeah. Then on the other side, marketing, when they address these questions, needs to share the content with sales that says, look, when a client is asking about this, here's a good piece of content to share with them. When you combine those together, what happens is sales becomes a mouthpiece back into marketing that says, here's the type of content to create. And then sales now has tools that when you, when you haven't heard from the client in a week, Instead of calling up with a begging tone, you get to call up and say, hey, when we spoke, you mentioned you had this issue. And here's an article, here's a video, here's a piece of content that I think may be helpful for you around that topic. And then if you're using advanced analytics, you can see how many people they share that with. And if you send something that gets shared 37 times, you probably struck a chord with them. Mm. But too often, salespeople are reinventing the answer over and over again because they're not communicating back into marketing, and that's unfortunate for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I really like how you close the loop there between the sales and marketing, and I guess in larger organizations that that's typically the way things happen, unfortunately. Um, and, and these days with the website and social media and other online tools, being available for us, and and as you said earlier, you know, it, it magnifies the impact of anything happening. So that using information and answering questions that clients have, it, it just magnifies the impact of providing that information and, and educating the audience. Yeah, I mean, the the idea is that long gone are the days of somebody getting all the information directly from the salesperson. So they're going to they're gonna go down part of the journey on their own via your website. So you can either rely on the client finding information on their own or you can spoon feed it to them as a, as a tool to follow up. Hmm. And I think the latter is a much better path to take. Yeah, just make it easy for them to find the information they need and, and it's easy to customize and structure it in a way that, that – makes sense to the individual customers. Absolutely. And if you want to really engage sale of the salespeople, if you're a marketer, what you do is say, look, and we're going to use one of these advanced analytic tools like HubSpot, like Marketo, like, you know, whatever you want to use. And we will deliver to you, Mr. and Ms. Salesperson, all the information about how many times that client looked at that article and shared it with other people. And so guess what? If you share a piece of content with them and they now share it with a bunch of people internally, you know that you're onto something and you found a topic that's relevant to them. Hmm. That's right. And rest assured, if your client isn't getting the answers and the information from you, it's not like they're not getting the information, they're just <laughs> getting it from someone else. That's right, yeah. So, if, yeah, that's, that's one thing that Marcus says a lot and I, I really like that. So if you don't answer the question, somebody else will. So would you rather have would you rather have your potential client go to the competitor's website to find the information they need or do you answer it on yours? Exactly. Just a bit of a rhetorical question, obviously. All right. We hope um, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, I still hear I still hear the argument that well, oh, if we share too much, you know, the competitor might find out. And I think that we talked about that a little bit in the last episode. Uh, the, where you're on, um, the competitor might find out. I think your point was that the competitor probably knows already, so you might as well tell the customer. The competitor knows, in <laughs> fact, the competitor knows so well. In the, to give an idea, 
one of the most protective industries on the planet is the pharmaceutical industry. (laughs) And in my prior business, there's a lot of work in the pharmaceutical industry. And we happen to have been working with two companies that um, I was the only person in the company that realized we were working with both companies who were working on the same product, trying to get it to market. And of course, no one was allowed to talk to anybody about this. And our own internal teams didn't even know that we had both projects going simultaneously. And I remember sitting in a meeting, listening in, and client A had just had a meeting where they said, yep, we're going to have everything ready on May 15th. And client B said, look, you know, we're racing these guys to get there. And, um, and they're probably going to have this thing out like early September. Now, internally, they think it's going to be middle of May, but we know they can't get there. <laughs> and it's going to be early, early September. And the funny part was, the other company was diligent, was telling everybody early May, and guess what? They delivered it on the exact date that their competitor said they were going to deliver it. <laughs> so this notion of, like, you know something your competitor doesn't know is ridiculous. So the other, the other way you have to look at it is this way. If you don't share it because you're concerned about your competitor, that means that you're, you are acting – because of fear of your competitor first Mm. and helping your client second. Yeah. And if you do that, then you better be really good at it because my guess is you're not going to be able to sustain that and your clients are going to go elsewhere. Mm. Yeah. Great advice. All right. This has been fascinating, Ian. I think it's uh, time now. I know you did the buzz once before, but I'm fascinated to see whether the answers are still the same after a year. So, we'll find out. Yeah, yeah. So just to remind our audience, the buzz is our innovation round designed to help our audience who, you know, are primarily innovators and leaders in their field but deliver some tips from your experience. So we've got five questions that um, we're going to ask. So what's the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Um, to be more innovative, I'd say just be entirely focused on what problems your clients need to solve. And if you do that, you will, you will help them find things and you'll help, you'll help create new opportunities that no one had thought of before. Mm. Yeah, great advice. I love that. And I think last time you, you said something very similar. So it's good. <laughs> good to be consistent. Um, number two then, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Um, you know what? It's it's a very similar answer, mm. which is I'm constantly listening to my audience and my clients and getting feedback. So anytime, like, for example, the same side quadrants came out of talking with clients about the best way to implement same side selling in a repeatable way for them. And the way we came up with the um, with the client vision pyramid was a similar thing, which is, well, how do we position against these other companies? And it was just listening to what people wanted that's what that's what's helped create the yeah, the greatest things mm. yeah great advice listening to feedback and so how do you go about getting that feedback when you know um or understanding that feedback to put it in a different light so often people say that oh that was a great speech or that was a great meeting um so how do you then take that to get something meaningful back in terms of feedback well, see, every time, every time I speak, I start by saying, what are the actionable takeaways for the audience, and then how do I deliver those to them? So if you're an attendant, if, if you're an attendee, in my sessions, it's pretty easy. But if you're someone who's an attendee and, you're, and someone else is speaking, you just want to think to yourself, what's actionable that I can use, and how will I apply it? So I've taken these concepts, so what? What can I do tomorrow to start moving this a little bit forward? And great speakers will help do that for you. And the ones who don't, don't just you know, throw your hands up in the air. Or think about how you can apply. Hmm. Yeah, fabulous advice. All right, what's your favorite tool or system for improving your own productivity and allowing you to be more innovative? Um, so there are two things. So in terms of productivity, I use a tool called Contactually, Mm -hmm. and Contactually is a CRM tool that allows you to, in essence, categorize or put people into buckets 
with specified follow-up intervals. So if you don't do it, it reminds you to. Mm. Um, so that helps me. The other one is from a friend of mine, Neen James, who speaks a fair amount about productivity. And this is the simplest yet incredibly, incredibly powerful piece of advice. Is she says, every day, the first task you should do is on a Post-it note, write down the three things that are the most important things for you to get done that day. And just have a pact with yourself that you're not gonna you're not gonna get distracted by other things, and you're not gonna finish your day until those three things are done. And her comment is, there's so many people that go day in and day out without getting the most important things done. If you do it this way, at a minimum, you're gonna get the three most important mm. things done every day, which puts you ahead of the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah, that's I like that technique. I I use something very similar myself. It's it's the what I use is a one three five um, thing. So I have one that's an absolute must. It's the most important thing, and then three, three that really should get done as well, and then five. So you know, in worst case scenario, you'll only get the one done if it's a bigger thing, but you know that you've done the most important one. So yeah, great. Yeah, I like I like the idea of the post-it note. Keep it in front of your face. All right. Um, so, and contactually is great. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's something that reminds you not to drop the ball on on the communication and follow up with clients. Yep. So, what's the best way to keep a project or a client on track? Um, have the results in mind. So, hmm. if you're constantly revisiting the results, then any little political discussion or anything else goes out the window because unless it impacts the results, it doesn't matter. And so when someone all of a sudden brings something up that's on a different tangent, you get to say, huh, well, how does that tie in with these results or do we need to modify what meaningful results would look like? Mm. But simply by focusing on the results, you can make sure that everyone's on the same page because someone else has to tell you why that, why they're, what they're bringing up right now is in the best interest of the results, which often they'll realize it isn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful advice, and it ties in so well with the whole idea of same-side selling. Okay, what's, I the, hope so. <laughs> what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? And I, you've probably told us that a few times during the interview. Yeah, you know what? It's just it's and this is boring for people to to hear it again, but it really it just got to come back to it comes back to knowing what problems you solve. So the thing is that the the mistake that people often make when they come up with these elevator rants is they try to use marketing speak to make it generic and apply to everybody. Mm. The reality is that you want to be hyper focused and incredibly specific about the problems that you solve. And when that happens, you're like a magnet attracting the ideal customers. I've got a client of mine who sells technology solutions. And they used to say they sold to everybody. And now they say, well, it's either professional services firms like law firms or accounting firms where if their systems are down, it costs them real money. Or it's trade associations where if their systems are down, it makes them less relevant and they have trouble maintaining their credibility with their base. And in both cases, it's organizations who say, look, if I don't have modern technology, then I can't attract millennials to my business. So their message became hyper-focused, and now mm. their biggest problem is that they can't hire people fast enough <laughs> to keep up with the demand in their business. Yeah. And their yeah. market has gotten more competitive, not less competitive, but they're growing and just bursting at the seams because mm. their message is hyper-focused. Yeah, that that is such a wonderful story, and I see that so many times exactly the way you describe it. So people have a fear of niching down and and getting to that hyper focused area because they they've got this fear of missing out on something that might be outside of their focus area that they should be niching down to. But the every time somebody does it well the opposite happens. They experience something like what you've just described. Absolutely, because no way, nobody refers somebody to a great generalist. Mm. You refer people to specialists. Yeah. And so if I'm a law firm, do I want to deal with somebody who primarily deals with law firms or do I want somebody who deals with all sorts of different businesses 
and they perceive law firms to be the same as everyone else. Hmm. Like, no, I want people who think we're special and different, even if we're not. Yeah. All right. Great advice. So what's the future then for, for you, Ian? And um, is there another book on the horizon? Um, you know what? I'm sure I'll end up writing another book <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I feel like there's a need for it. We may re-release Same Side Selling. And, um, you know, right now I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on these digital products because there's a whole marketplace that I can't necessarily serve when I'm not physically there. But through the Same Side Selling Academy, it's just a great community where people support each other and there's lessons every week and it just allows people to, to build on this and the, 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 the way you've got it going right now, it's um, the initial launch until January is free. So it's just my belief getting back to results was, look, when we initially launched this, there are going to be little bugs in it. There's going to be things that we're missing that people want. So I don't want anyone paying for that until it actually can deliver what people need. Mm -hmm. And so, so I kind of practice what I preach. Yeah, that's great. So the Same Side Selling Academy, that's a private Facebook group, is it? Yep, it is. Well, it's a private Facebook group, and there's a whole secondary component to it as well that's um, 30 different modules we'll be launching in uh, January 2018 that are instructional modules so that people who, let's say, came to a program and need reinforcement, they have that. Mm -hmm. Organizations who maybe sent 50 people um, to a full day program with me and now they've got three new people well they don't have to send three people to training they can just run them through the digital program yeah okay yeah that's great and that gives you leverage as well so reach more people with the yeah. message and the information right yeah this is you know for, for years it's just there's a segment of the market that I couldn't help because I didn't have a, a platform or a tool that would allow us allow me to help them without physically being there and now we've created something that hopefully solves that. So that's yeah. kind of a uh, exciting thing for me, and we'll we'll see how all that plays out. And all this information you can get at ianaltman.com. Yeah, that's great. So, and we'll post links to all of that in the show notes on the podcast episode, so people can go check it out and see whether it's a fit for them. Exactly, yeah. happens to be true. Hmm. <laughs> all right, um, so. What's the number one piece of advice you'd give to any business owner who wants to be a leader in innovation and in productivity and in their field? Um, it's going to sound like a, a broken <laughs> record, 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 but yeah. but but guess what? It's it's a it's about making sure that you're always focused on what you're solving for those clients and why. And hmm. it's so easy for people to get um, drawn into other areas that aren't that important. And if we can get them to focus on that specific aspect, then it changes everything. And that's mm. what we want to get to. So um, that, that aspect of being able to focus on the problems you solve so that your employees, your customers, all the stakeholders know exactly what problem you solve, that leads to additional business. That allows you to stand out. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is for people to really get those messages down well. Mm. Yeah, great advice. And I'm, I'm reminded because you said it changes everything. I'm reminded of uh, Seth Godin who um, one of the things he said in a, a mastermind group I'm involved in was um, really understanding and really niching down on your target audience and uh, really understanding their, their needs changes everything. So, Yeah, which, so Seth so, and I would be in total agreement on that. Yeah. Well, it's hard to disagree with Seth on most things. Most things, yeah. most things, that's true. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so this has been fabulous, Ian. I've really enjoyed this again. I knew I would because we have had a discussion before. So um, where can people reach out and say thank you for all you've shared today? Um, you know what? The easiest thing is you can reach me uh, on my website is ianaltman.com. So it's I-A-N-A-L-T-M-A-N. That happens to also be my handle on Twitter. And... Um, and certainly people can reach out to me on LinkedIn, Facebook, all those things, and just mention the uh, Anova Biz podcast or Anova Buzz podcast, and, um, and then that way I'll know where it came from. Mm. And i um, happy to connect with people there. All right. Thanks, Ian. We'll have those links in the show notes to make it easy for people. So finally then, who would you like me to interview on a future Anova Buzz podcast and why? Um, you know what? There are a lot of people that you mm. should interview, but I mentioned Neen James in terms of productivity. Yeah. And if you haven't had Neen on your program, 
um, Neen is somebody who I would definitely reach out to. Okay, no, I haven't had Neen on the program, yeah. so... Uh, and, if you, and it's just, she's at neenjames.com. Okay, wonderful. So, Neen, look out for an invitation from us, courtesy of Ian Altman. Excellent. So thanks again for sharing your time and insights with us so generously today, Ian. I've learned a lot. I've got a whole page of notes here, and um, I'm looking forward to publishing this podcast and sharing it with my audience because I think there's just so much value in this. Um, As I say, I've enjoyed this, and I wish you all the best for the future, and let's keep in touch. Absolutely, Jürgen. Thanks so much. Thanks. Well, I hope you enjoyed hearing from Ian as much as I enjoyed this interview. It was really fascinating. And I hope you've taken notes on the many suggestions and ideas that Ian shared. Now, all those ideas and tips that Ian shared with us can be found at innovabiz.com.au forward slash same side selling. That is same side selling, as I said, S-A-M-E-S-I-D-E-S-E-L-L-I-N-G. All lowercase, all one word, in overbiz.com.au forward slash same side selling. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Ian there as well as the link to the Same Side Selling Academy. We'd love to hear about your biggest takeaway from this episode and the action you'll take as a result in the comments section of the blog post. Ian suggested I interview Neen James on a future Innova Buzz podcast. So, Neen, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Ian Altman. If you haven't already done so, head on over to iTunes or Stitcher or Pocket Casts and subscribe to the Innova Buzz podcast so you'll never miss a future episode. If you haven't already left a review, what are you waiting for? Get to it. Seriously, though, we always welcome feedback and reviews help us to let us know how we're doing. If there's anything you'd like us to cover or questions you want answered on a future Nova Buzz podcast or guests you'd like us to interview, please send those ideas to us. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from Innova Biz. Remember to be awesome and keep innovating.